Okay, good morning everybody. Um, do somebody put your hand up at the back if you can't hear me. I'm not used to speaking with a microphone, often I don't need it, so I made, if I need to move it away, you can let me know that as well. Um, so this morning I am hopefully going to talk you through um, some of the challenges facing people who are dealing with managing semi-natural habitats in Ireland. I'll touch on a couple of different habitats, but obviously of course the, the main focus is very much on native woodlands. I'm an ecologist. Um, I've done a lot of work on native woodlands. My PhD involved looking at woodlands. I've worked on the National Survey of Native Woodlands. I've also surveyed some of our most rare and protected uh, woodland types as part of Annex Habitat Monitoring as well. But I've worked in a lot of different habitats. I've also worked quite a bit in grasslands as well and on fens. So I'm going to just touch on those to give a little bit of a broader picture to help put things in context. So I thought it would start quite broad, really, because we, we do tend, when we're looking at managing any semi-natural habitats, we are looking at walking a kind of a tightrope uh, between too little and too much management. And we, kn we know this from a lot of different sources. So I'm going to start with something quite broad, a project called the Threatened Plants Project. Uh, it covered Britain and Ireland. Over 2,000 sites were visited. 50 different species were the target of this big project. And they were chosen specifically to be from a range of different habitats. So some of them are from woodlands, some of them are from open habitats, upland and lowland. A specifically broad range of uncommon or declining species were looked at. And what I want to draw your attention to is the findings in particular in terms of the threats on this really broad suite of species. And if you look at the very first item on the list, the biggest threat by far to a really broad ranging suite of, of plant species is lack of management and undergrazing. So I thought that was quite interesting that that stood out so much, but really, really across the board. But second on the list, and also a very, very important factor in terms of threats facing these species, is agriculture intensification and overgrazing. So we are walking a tightrope. It is often a case of too little or too much management. Just also to quickly draw your attention, I'll, I'll come back and touch on this, and I'm sure it'll be a theme over the two days in the conference, invasives. When you look at the big picture across many, many habitats, right down at the bottom of this list is where non-native invasive species come. So it's be important to contrast that when we look at native woodlands in particular. Again, keeping the picture broad, I was involved in working on the Irish Semi-Natural Grassland Survey, a huge survey that took place over multiple years, uh, well over a thousand sites visited, well over four and a half thousand vegetation quadrats carried out, huge amount of data. So we have a good idea of what's happening in our grasslands. And all across Ireland, in our grasslands, the biggest issue is under management and abandonment. Hot on its heels, the second issue is intensification and issues related to that. So again, we're walking this tightrope, things are either abandoned or overmanaged. And just very quickly, anecdotally, I also work with tiny little rare snails. I couldn't do a presentation without having, without having a snail picture. So I work with uh, vertigo snails, and that brings me into a lot of fens. And I've spent a lot of time assessing and, um, fens and habitat quality and looking at issues and threats and management. A huge problem with our fens across Ireland is also lack of management and abandonment. Like in the photo here, huge buildup of dense litter doesn't allow the typical flora to flourish. It's choked with, with dead plant material due to lack of grazers. So what about our woodlands? Let's get on to the woodlands. Uh, we're also in the very happy position in Ireland of having had a multi-year, very broad-ranging national survey of our semi-natural <coughs> woodlands, or our native woodlands in Ireland. Um, the survey visited, again, well over 1,000 uh, sites and collected releves in, I think, over 1,600, or quadrats, vegetation quadrats, well over 1,600 locations. So again, we've quite a lot of data across a lot of different habitat types. The main threats, so the main issues that have, that have appeared from this work, invasive species, heavy grazing, and dam a suite of damaging activities. So these are the main issues that come out from our studies looking at woodland habitats and issues that face them all across the country. So quite interesting to see the top things that have been picked out. This was written up and published, the, the final results of this multi-year survey in 2008. Just uh, other things have happened since. There's been time to kind of digest the information. Um, so this, uh, the second part of the slide shows a kind of a, a summary, a similar summary from a very recent publication by John Cross and Kevin Collins in 2017. And they pull out as the main issues, the publication is called Management Guidelines for Ireland's Native Woodlands. They pull out non-native invasive species, inappropriate grazing regime, as 
probably the top two issues. And you'll notice there, inappropriate grazing regime has been mentioned rather than specifically heavy grazing. In the interim, we've had some more detailed studies on individual woodland types. And for example, on our alluvial woodlands, Daniel mentioned them earlier, some of our rarest types, undergrazing is often an issue there. In our oak woods, overgrazing is definitely the big standout issue. So inappropriate grazing regime is, is, a, is a big issue. And related to that, as well as to some other factors, is poor woodland structure, lack of natural regeneration. So this is the picture of some of the biggest challenges that face our native woodlands. Now, I'm not going to read through these. I'm going to just flick it up. There are lots of other issues. It's a short talk. We can't touch on them all. There are lots of other issues and challenges that face people that are managing native woodlands. Um, and some of these will be more important on individual sites uh, compared to others, just to acknowledge uh, that there are a number of different issues and challenges to be faced. So I'm going to focus for most of the talk on grazing as an issue, but before I do, just to very quickly give an overview and a little taster on uh, some of the data that exists on invasive species, it being perhaps the other biggest issue that people managing native woodlands face. So the biggest troublemaker, uh, without a doubt, is rhododendron ponticum. But from the National Survey of Native Woodlands, with all these woodland sites visited, which non-native species, non species were recorded most frequently? In terms of the trees, sycamore and beech were found in three quarters of all of the sites visited. So we know they're common, but the fact that they're present in three quarters of our woodlands is quite interesting. Um, in terms of shrubs, rhododendron and laurel are present at about a quarter of our sites, uh, which could be looked at as being quite a, a depressing figure, really. That's across all types of woodlands all across the country. Um, just to break that down a very little bit, if we just look at the first two, first two lines on this graph here, the top one is rhododendron, the second one is cherry laurel. The grey area indicates a lighter infestation and the black area indicates a heavier <coughs> infestation. So we'll say of the 25% of woodlands that are affected by rhododendron ponticum, about half of those are classified as having a light level of infestation. So it gives us a little cause for hope um, that it might be easier or quicker to tackle. So I think thinking about prioritising our actions and our efforts, uh, that's quite, uh, quite informative. So to move on to grazing, uh, a lot of you are familiar, you don't need to be told to what kind of signs to look for in terms of looking for grazing, but some may not be. On the left-hand side, there's a very clear browse line evidence. If you walk into a woodland like that, you can see that the deer have been browsing on the ivy on the trees, a very, very distinct browse line. And on the right-hand side, uh, we have what we call the topiary effect, where uh, grazers have been nibbling, in this case, on a, on a hawthorn. So these are some of the types of, uh, of things. We've, Daniel also showed earlier uh, evidence of bark stripping. These are some of the things you might be looking at in terms of grazing, grazing damage or grazing evidence. Again, these graphs are both from the National Survey of Native Woodlands. Uh, on the upper graph, you can see that about 12% of the woodland sites visited were classified as having a high or severe level of grazing, apparent. If you add in the moderate levels of grazing, it pushes it up about 30%. 37% of sites had no obvious evidence of grazing. Now, it may be that the, the grazing level was so low it couldn't be picked up, but it was either low or non-existent. Uh, so that just gives you an idea of what, what was found when these sites were visited. Ideally, what you want is you want this, this bar to be the tallest one, really, I guess. You want low grazing. We'll come to that. And in terms of the species, cattle were the most common species of grazer noted in the woodlands. And again, it's across all types of woodlands all across the country. And deer were the second most common type of grazers. The cattle were, of course, more common in uh, lowland habitats and the deer in upland habitats, kind of a broad, uh, a broad pattern. So has there been more detailed work on <coughs> grazing and the effects of grazing in Ireland? Well, there has. There's been quite a lot of work specifically looking at the effects of grazing on woodlands in Ireland. Um, so I'm going to just mention a couple of studies. This list isn't supposed to be exhaustive, but it gives an idea of some recent studies and some studies across a suite of different woodland types. Uh, Phil Perrin has done work on yew woodlands. Now, uh, Phil was uh, the lead author on the National Survey of Native Woodlands. Before that, uh, in his PhD, he studied yew woodlands and looked at long-term grazing exclosures and how the vegetation and the woodlands were affected by these long-term vegetation exclosures. And just very, very briefly, um, found a decrease in biodiversity and a shift in species composition within the grazing exclosures, long-term grazing exclosures. So you're talking a couple of decades of exclosure. Again, very quickly, just to touch on the work of Cooper and McCann, they worked in South Fermanagh in wet oak woodlands. And they found not only a shift in species composition, but a shift in woodland type. They found, or they deduced, that oak woodlands are more likely to be driven towards being dominated by ash if there's long-term grazing exposure. 
they also uh, exclude exclosure. <laughs> they also found that um, the regeneration and the establishment of non-native species was facilitated by the, ex the long-term excluding of grazers. So I'm going to mention a little bit more about my own work in Ash Hazel Woodlands. And uh, at the very end, just quickly mention work by Miles Newman, uh, and he's pulling together a lot of work on oak woodlands. So my PhD, I looked at uh, the effects uh, on uh, um, plant communities and snail communities. So the effect on biodiversity, if you excluded grazers, and we looked at a range of habitats, we looked at woodlands, scrub, and grassland. You can see scrub on the left-hand side, and you can see an example of a grassland exclosure on the right-hand side. The main grazers we were excluding were cattle, feral goats, and the odd errant deer. The work was mainly in North Clare and South Galway, so the kind of the broader burn region. The woodlands are ash hazel woodlands in that region. Um, typically hazel dominated. Um, occasional emergence, these are often ash. A lot of woodland ecologists struggle with the idea that you can have a woodland canopy that's only six meters tall, but they certainly are, are woodlands. On the right hand side, you can see typical, the top, top most common species. You can uh, maybe make a picture of what the woodlands look like. The trees are highlighted in orange. They're often very small, the woodland habitats, woodland proper in the burren and quite fragmented. But they're very rich in ground flora and rich in, in bryophytes and lichens as well. And just in terms of the richness, just from the four woodland study sites, the study plots were 20 by 20 meters. That should say eight rather than four, because in each site there was a fenced plot and a control plot. So eight 20 by 20 meter patches on four sites had 100 vascular plant species. That's more than 10% of our native flora of Ireland. So they are definitely diverse. And there was a lot of old woodland indicators. I'll just draw your attention on the left-hand side. This is hazel gloves fungus. And up here, this is lungwort. Many areas um, with these species quite common. So there's no doubt that these are typical woodlands. They're species-rich woodlands. And they, they contain a suite of species that indicate continuity of woodland cover. So it's, uh, it's always very daunting starting out on a PhD and looking to try to see something that's likely to be a long-term change and hoping to have something to say after three years. So it was, a, it was a nervous start, but we did see changes. We saw significant changes in the grasslands. Uh, I'm not going to touch on that at all here. But we did see changes in the woodlands. Um, the field layer changed dramatically. There was an average increase of about a third in the cover of the field layer. Um, in some sites, there was a change of up to 50%. So some sites had been trampled by the grazers, and when the, that pressure was reduced, there was a kind of a flush of species. In the controls, there was a small increase, but it was nothing like the same scale. And related to that, there was a decrease in the cover of bare earth uh, inside the exclosures as well. So that was a very obvious um, change. So we saw an increase in species number, which was quite distinct inside the fenced exclosures, and no similar, um, nothing similar in scale at all in the controls. Um, the changes were across herbs, grasses, and low woody species. They all showed some, some change. But we really do know this is a study that needs long-term work. These are short-term findings. But we can say in the short term, there was an increase in biodiversity. Uh, this year, hopefully, this year will be year 12 after the fences went up. Um, hopefully, we will have a master's student revisiting the sites, and we will see what changes are noticeable at this time frame. A master's student has visited them and resurveyed Sheila Murphy uh, at year seven. She noticed that the initial increase in species richness has dropped off, and regeneration was greater inside the fences. So there is definitely um, changes happening over time, and you often have this, this sort of cycle. So what about the long term, longer term studies that are happening in Ireland? I mentioned there's been quite a bit of work in oak woodlands. One person in particular, Miles Newman, he, he did his PhD on this and there are some associated papers. He's pulled together a lot of the data from three of our national parks, seven grazing exclosures, some of them 40 years standing. And just to very simply touch on some of his findings, he has shown quite strongly from these multiple sites that there's a great homogenization of the vegetation inside long-term grazing exclosures. And a small suite of species drive that homogenization. So the species mentioned there, great woodrush, bramble, honeysuckle, bilberry, ivy, and bracken, some or all of those tend to become the dominant or the driving changing forces inside grazing exclosures. So to wrap up, what are the recommendations? And this is looking at a breadth of work. I've mentioned some of the Irish studies just very, very briefly, but also looking at outside uh, research outside of Ireland. Um, grazing management is absolutely needed. There is no question. But long-term grazer exclusion does not seem to be the best way to do it. Adaptive and responsive herbivore management programs are needed. Uh, they need to be responsive to individual conditions as populations change, as populations move through a landscape, and as the habitat itself evolves.
A diversity of approaches is really desirable, both across space and across time. A diversity of approaches, approaches gives a diversity of results. Diversity is good for biodiversity. Uh, movable fences may be worth considering where fencing is thought to be a, a, a necessary or, or a, a likely option. So look, there are very many challenges when managing native woodlands. Foremost is getting the grazing right to allow regeneration. A lot of other things will fall into place easier if you get the grazing right. The other big challenges are invasives. Um, the small size and the fragmented nature of our woodlands, they really are habitats that should be more extensive in nature, so we need to look at that. We also need to look at facilitating uh, production from our woodlands and other use, so recreational use, for example, where appropriate. So clear plans are needed, like management plans, clear supports, communication, and these need to make sense at a site level for individual landowners and managers, but also at regional and national levels in terms of strategic planning and for policymakers. And that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>